Hello, everybody. Greetings and welcome to our webinar for today, our panel discussion. Let me share a screen with you so we all know why we're here. This is the event Teach Your English with Color Vowel Beyond the Single Accent Model. We're so glad to have you here today. I'm Karen Taylor of the Color Vowel Chart. I'll be introducing people to start, including you, starting with you. If you would, please take a moment to find the chat. Find the chat. And in the chat, we have, by the way, over, 40, over 30 countries are represented today in our registrant base. That's very, very exciting. Uh, please take a moment to introduce yourself by name, country, and languages spoken. It's so relevant today to know what languages are represented in the room. Okay, find that chat. And as more people enter the room, uh, they'll be reminded, sorry about that, there we go. Okay, welcome Regina from Brazil. Welcome Gilson from Brazil. Uh, I see lots of wonderful countries. Bridget, where are you from? I see Chris is here from the USA. He speaks Spanish. Kaori is here. Hello, Jonah. Great to see you. Okay. We're doing introductions in the chat. And as I do that, I would like to introduce a few people in the room. First of all, let's just say hello with our hands. Great to see everybody. Yeah. Beautiful. You're there. Um, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. I'm Karen Taylor of the Color Vowel Chart. Uh, we're doing introductions right now and we're glad to have you. Um, today's session, we are happy to feature some gifted panelists who work with Color Vowel and are teachers of English. Um, I'd like to start uh, with, uh, I'll start with them shortly, but I'd like to start with a little bit of housekeeping uh, and some uh, people you need to know. Jennifer Campion, can you say hello? Hi, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> Welcome. I'm the business manager for English Language Training Solutions. So if you have any questions about our training or uh, materials, uh, feel free to drop a, a note in the chat. Thanks. You'll see Jennifer in the chat uh, responding to any questions about how to find uh, the chart, how to find training, how to find materials and products that we provide teachers with. Uh, so that's Jennifer. Um, you'll notice uh, Jennifer has a CV before her name, um, as do many of our other folks in the room so far. CV stands for color vowel. If you are a color vowel trained teacher like Jennifer is, um, please take a moment and find your rename or change name feature here in Zoom and add those letters before your name if you like. Uh, what that means is that when you uh, contribute to the chat, then other folks know that you're a trained teacher and we just get an idea of who, who's speaking for what reason. So add CV to your name if you're a Color Vowel trained teacher. If you're new to Color Vowel, welcome. That is why we're here. We're here to meet you and we're very happy to have you. Okay. Um, I want to now introduce uh, Lynn. Hi, Lynn Swanda. Greetings. So Lynn is going to stay muted because, no, say hello. <laughs> I'm kidding. Hi. <laughs> but the, the joke is Lynn is going to be our very kind uh, mute patrol. We have a lot of people in the room and in case somebody is unmuting themselves by accident, she will kindly mute you and help us stay orderly in terms of um, being able to hear each other, okay? Our panelists will be sharing some wonderful information um, and insights about their experience. And we all, of course, want to hear, okay? Thank you. I have a third, let's see, Aviva, are you in the room? I think you are. Hello. Hi, Aviva. Go ahead and open up your mic. Say hello to us. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening. Hi, my name's Aviva. <laughs> Aviva's one of our trained teachers. She's in Florida. Um, Aviva has volunteered for an important role here. Um, and that is recognizing that we have a very diverse audience. Again, over 30 countries represented amongst our live participants and those who will watch this session in its recorded state afterward. 
Um, in the interest of being accessible to many people from many different language backgrounds, uh, Aviva will be our accessibility ambassador. So you might see her uh, type of phrase that we use or a type of reference that was just mentioned. And um, so she's just back there sort of watching for anything that would help everybody in our audience access the terms and ideas that are referred to in case they're new for some of us. Okay, wonderful. Now, what about us? <laughs> Shall we get started? I think we have our intros taken care of. Um, we're so glad to have you. If you are here uh, for a specific reason, you know, let us know. Use the chat. Let's talk about questions. You can ask any question or make any comment in real time in the chat. Please feel free to use that as a sideboard conversation. But that said, um, today's conversation is very much about sound and know that you'll get the recorded session so you don't have to take notes. You're also going to receive a copy of the chat. So if there's something mentioned there, no worries, you'll see it again or you can access it. Um, the questions you ask in the chat are anytime questions. You might receive an answer or we might collect your question and use it in the panel discussion, okay? Um, we will start with panel presentations. We're going to start with Lisa Lamar, who's here in the room. Hi, Lisa. Great. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, after Lisa, uh, Gemma Archer will give a presentation. Hi, Gemma. Great to have you. And Hello. after Gemma, we've got Claire. Hi, Claire. You can wave your hands up there. Welcome. Claire's in New Mexico. Um, and so we'll be introducing each of our panelists. They will each present for approximately 15 minutes, more or less. And then they will take short, uh, they'll take questions for about five minutes, each of them after their session. So think this way, uh, during each panelist's presentation, uh, you can write down questions in the chat or hold them for that five minute uh, immediate follow-up. Okay, and these would be questions directed specifically at their presentation, maybe a clarification, maybe one small elaboration. So we'll keep that little question session short before we end up with the next panelist. After our three panelists have presented and answered a few small questions, uh, we will then open the floor to our discussion. And I'll be leading that with questions raised in the chat. Um, I'll also invite larger questions at that time and I have a few of my own for our panelists regarding accent, teaching, and the teaching of spoken English. Okay, um, so that's a little bit of how today will will go. Okay, if you have any questions at this time, feel free to post those. So for now, what I'd like to do is make sure we all know some of the common references. Today's talk is teaching your English with color vowel. Um, so what is your English? How do you identify it? Please use the chat for a moment. And if, if you can, see if you feel comfortable with a label. What label do you use? For example, I speak North American English. That's one label I feel comfortable uh, about, about myself. I would also say I speak Western American English. So those are two labels I'm comfortable with. If you would, go find the chat and see if, if you're not comfortable, you can say, I don't use a label for my English, but we'd like to get an idea of how we start uh, characterizing our own Englishes. And I use that plural, Englishes. Good. Ah, a global English. Thank you very much. I see that term, Mariana. A global English. Uh-huh. Mid-Atlantic English would be referring to uh, the United States in that mid-Atlantic region between New York down um, down to you know somewhere in the southern area near Florida. Um, English with a Japanese accent. Thank you, Kaori. Uh, so you can describe your English from the perspective of your first language. Canadian English, a little bit different than US English. So now we have another breakdown of North American English. Okay. Uh, Southeast American, Latin American accent, lots of ways we describe ourselves. Right. Um, Laura, I'm so glad you're in the room, Laura Holland. Uh, she speaks North American English with a softened Midwestern vowel and a touch of the East Coast. It sounds like a complex wine <laughs> or, or a really good soup. <laughs> right. 
Um, Laura, I'll see if I might be mentioning uh, your story and inviting you to, to in introduce your name um, on microphone in a few minutes. Just be aware. <laughs> Uh, Laura is featured in our Color Val Level 1 training course on the topic of accents, in fact. So glad to have you here. Uh, Lucy says she's, you know, she's got North London English middle class. So adding in some of the other factors that influence our Englishes, uh, it might be that economic class plays a role because that also is part of who we spend time with. Okay. Um, South Philly, not just one city, Philadelphia, but South Philly from Sharon, uh, describing that she, you know, her accent is uh, typical of that particular region. Okay, wonderful, everybody. Um, and British English with Scottish accents. Thank you, Joanne. I'm glad to see that we have another uh, Scottish English speaker in the room, like Gemma. Okay, thank you, everybody. So starting with that, uh, that's a wonderful background to our topic today, which is how is it that we understand each other? Um, does, do you understand me right now? I think you do. Um, if you don't, you know, then you might be leaning in and then you'll understand. Uh, we're using a common language right now. And the way I speak is different from the way arguably everybody else speaks. Maybe we all speak differently, and yet we all understand each other right now. And that is fascinating. Okay? As speakers, we don't have to go any deeper than that. We can simply say we understand each other. But as teachers of English, and most people in the room are teachers of English, we do have some people who have labeled themselves as learners of English, and that's fine too. So they're here for that conversation. But as teachers and learners of English, regardless, we need ways to talk about sound that keep us in some kind of a common reference so that we are being productive uh, in the right ways and not getting stuck on corrections that don't have necessarily a very strong purpose behind them other than making you sound like me, not my purpose. So I'm not interested in having anyone sound like me. I just want to be sure we all understand each other. That's a thought there. So ColorVal is dedicated to mutual comprehensibility. And without um, any more delay, I'd like to show you a little bit about ColorVal as an introduction to our topic today. All right. I have three color vowels I'd like to show you. Um, these are the three, okay? Now, I'm using images for the time being. I'll show you another version of color vowels in just a moment. Uh, some of you are very familiar and some of you are new. So let's take everybody a moment to have fresh eyes and look at these three images. This is green tea. If you would, please take out a hand, uh, probably your dominant hand. And I'm going to ask you to use it the same way that I do. I'm watching you, I can see everybody most people, okay? Here we are with, um, here we are with green tea. Try that, green tea. Yeah, if you listen to the extension, the moment your hand is out, we'll hear this vowel sound. Green and T contain the E sound, E. And so anytime we come across that sound, we can now name it. We'll call it the green sound or the green T sound, that's fine. Yeah. Um, what kinds of words are green? Me, three. Uh, let's name a few. Go to the chat, please, and list some green words, please. Green words have the E sound. Okay. Over there, I see already tree, sleep, speak, team from Elizabeth, Bridget, thank you, be, seen, meaning. Yes, Sarah. So we can have longer words now. Let's aim for two syllable or three syllable words that are green in the stress. People is a nice green word. As you're writing, try this with me. Here's the hand again. Green tea people. Try that. Green tea people. Great. So we hear that P and, and that's the green part. That makes it a green word. The other syllable is there, it's important, and yet it doesn't have a color in our system. We'll call it colorless for right now, 
Okay, so people and not people. It's not people, it's people, right? Wonderful. So that's a green word. Our second sound um, is here, and this is a vowel sound called purple shirt. Try that. Purple shirt. Er, er. Um, what kind of word has er in it? Er, bird, exactly. HP, thank you. Nurse, third. Now, the word rat, that was interesting. I see the word rat there in the um, turtle is purple. Yes, purpose. But rat, that's so fascinating because it starts with that R sound that can be tricky. And yet we could think of it as a purple beginning, rat, something like that. But really, that is a black cat sound, rat, rat, ah, ah, ah. and I'll show you black cat in just a moment down here, okay? But for now, this is a purple sound. What makes these work, this is very important, everybody. What makes these work is that green and T have the same sound for all of us, right? Green and T match. If you don't have a match there, then we wanna know. We can, we can work with it, but green and T have the same sound. Purple and shirt have the same sound. So we can call a word like further or um, uh, university a purple word. Wonderful. I see lots of other words here. World. Uh, any long words? Think of a long word that's purple. Okay. Thirdly, blue moon. I'm using these three because they're very stable for us. Across accents, across dialects, we all have these sounds. Blue moon is the oo sound, and we can find it in short and long words alike. Um, so purpose, yes, is purple. Watch what we do here. Let's try now something new, blue moon, and I'll say um, uh, balloon, okay? I just put that in the chat so you can see. It's a quick way to show what we're doing when we teach. And I think I misspelled balloon, but I'm not teaching spelling today, so... I'll forgive myself, okay? So <laughs> blue moon, I'll do it again. Blue moon uh, balloon, there we go, okay? Um, can we think of any long words that are blue, please? Thank you, Herrick. Yes, purple shirt determine. Yes, blue moon constitution. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth, um, and so forth. Thank you. Now we start to see some words in the chat that might not be green, blue, or purple. And those would be jump off points or uh, moments that we might want to dig in and explore. But for the moment, we're just going to pay attention to these three and say that color vowels allow us to identify how a word sounds in English, okay? Fabulous. I'd like to turn to the chart of, actually, I'd like to turn straight ahead to what this looks like in teaching, because our three panelists are going to demonstrate briefly how they've been using the chart after they tell a bit about their own story, about their speech, their accent, and the chart. So let's look at how these symbols or these words can be used. Each symbol has a place on the color vowel chart. Okay, this is the color vowel chart. I'm going to uh, take uh, these guys right here, if I will, one moment. These blue symbols that you see here are sounds of other languages. And in this case, I'm going to use Spanish as my um, example language. So in Spanish, we have five vowels, a, e, i, o, and u. In English, we have quite a few more vowel sounds. And as you can see here, the, the challenge for a speaker of Spanish is recognizing that a ah is a sound that straddles several different color vowel sounds in English, vowel sounds, okay? Um, in order to make sense of this, I'd like to just turn briefly to the chart that's behind me. And I'm going to, let's see here, spotlight for everybody. This is the chart behind me. And I'd like to be sure we all understand that it is a map of the space in my mouth. And the space in my mouth when I'm facing in this direction allows me to notice what it sounds like when I have a high jaw and I smile, E. So go ahead and try this with me. You can just point yourself in the same direction. And as I move my arm down, you're going to hear the sound change down to black. We're just lowering the jaw as I lower my arm. Ready? E. Ah. Black cat 
ah. Try it one more time, slowly. E black cat ah. And so we can immediately notice that our sound changes as the shape in our mouth changes. In this case, when my jaw goes down or when it comes back up, okay? So these are the references I use when I teach English and it reflects largely my accent, but also other North American accents. Now, part of what led to this webinar was recognizing that we have speakers of English all over the world with accents that don't match up completely. And so today we're spending time with the Commonwealth color vowel chart that looks a little bit different. Um, right here is the North American chart that I just showed you. Uh, let me share that screen with you. Okay, this is the North American chart and images, as you can see. Um, Next to it, just below, I'll show you, this is the Commonwealth color vowel chart. And you'll find that it's identical here on the left side or in the front vowels. All of this remains the same, but things are a little different right over here in the, the central back low area. Um, and so you'll see teachers today using the chart in this way. Um, the images change slightly. Um, some notable changes are these three right here and right here. And so try these with me if you would, everybody. I'd like you to hear you say olive bottle all. Olive bottle all. This is the olive bottle sound. It goes right there. Okay, so we're just gonna put him right down there. This is tomato caught. Try that. Tomato caught ah. If you're a speaker of Commonwealth English, uh, then these two may very well match. Okay. Um, and then this is Auburn Fawn. Try that. Auburn Fawn or Auburn Fawn or. Now it's, it's, it might seem a bit different because um, this is not my accent or my dialect, but um, I have equivalent sounds that sound a little different. So let's just look here, try these, and then we'll be ready to uh, indulge and enjoy ourselves with our panelists. Okay. In the North American chart, we have. Similar sounds. This is olive sock ah. Try that. Olive sock ah. Good. Uh, the next I'd like to try with you is Auburn dog. So here's Auburn dog. Auburn dog ah. Go. Auburn dog ah. And a third that is a little different and not in the Commonwealth chart is orange door or. Try that orange door or. So if you are new to the color vowel chart, bear with us, you'll learn more. Mm -hmm. If you already know the chart, this should be quite intriguing, the idea that we have some changes between the two charts, okay? And you'll get to know a bit more of the Commonwealth chart today uh, so that you, you know that we can serve teachers and learners around the world through the way that you, the teacher, speak. And I'll say that this is sort of my last important point, um, that you can't teach anybody else's English, can you? Can you? That's my question. I can say it and ask it at the same time. I mean, really, if you were hired to teach an English that's different from yours, can you? It, it would be tricky, I think, to change the way we speak. Uh, there are certainly actors who can do this. Meryl Streep is wonderful. Um, she's talented. She has a dialect coach. Dialect coaches are very talented, but the majority of the world's people are not, we're, we're simply not wired to, ch to change the way we speak to some way that is not ours, okay? Um, and so we do need to teach from the way that we speak or the ways that we speak. And that's what's going to come up beautifully today. I'd like to introduce our panelists and I'm going to start by introducing Lisa. Uh, Lisa has been, um, teaching with us for quite some time and studying color vowel. Uh, Lisa is in New Zealand. Yeah. And I'm going to ask uh, her to introduce what she does and tell us a little bit about her story. So hello, Lisa. How are you? Hello. Hi, I'm fine. Thank you. 
Okay. Tell I'm, us a little I'm bit of your story it. with the color vowel chart. Was it, um, tell us when did you find out about it and then, and then how you related to it, would you? Uh, okay. Do you, do you want me to start my presentation now? Shall I yes, go ahead? Is, yeah. Exactly. This okay. is my awkward handover. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. And <laughs> right, sorry. Us. We're thrilled to have okay. you. Okay. So uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. So as, as Karen said, um, I'm Lisa from, from New Zealand. Um, and I'm going to share a screen um, and we'll, we'll just jump right into it. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, my school and um, that kind of thing. So I, I'm hoping, can it, can everybody see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. I'll put my timer on so I don't uh, go over time. Okay. So I'm here in New Zealand. I run a little language school here. Um, and it's an intensive um, English language course, but only for Japanese teenagers who attend um, private Catholic girls' school in, in Japan. Um, and they come here, as I said, for a year. Um, and this is our um, logo. We've got the Southern cross here and that's the name of our school southern cross language institute and our motto is bringing english to life um, and so that's why the students are come to new zealand to to get their speaking underway um, to really um to to really you know practice lots and lots of, of english speaking so that's the important thing um, so i'm going to tell you my experiences before I uh, found the color valve chart. So we have two courses. We've got our morning course, which is textbook based. And then we have our afternoon course, which is topic based. And in that afternoon course is like little micro courses. And pronunciation is one was one of those courses. So our pronunciation course was a 45 minute class once a week for the first half of the year. And then it was done and dusted with done pronunciation. Um, and bear with me. Um, so uh, pronunciation, what I mean when I say pronunciation is stress, intonation, rhythm, all that stuff just uh, comes under our term pronunciation. Our course was um, put together from lots of different textbooks. Um, and this picture here, I just grabbed off Google images. So it, but it could have been any one of us here at Southern Cross Language Institute. So here we were at the front of the class and we had all these, um, the IPA in the background, phonetic symbols scrawled all over the board. The biggest problem we had was in the busyness of a language classroom, when we didn't have enough time, we just left pronunciation. We forgot about it. We didn't do it at all. Um, and that annoyed us. We changed things around, but the same, we had the same outcome as far as the students were concerned. So um, here is a student in class. And so they're all Japanese students. And one of the sounds that Japanese people have a bit of a hard time with is the ah sound, that black cat ah sound. Because we've got an, an A here, they typically end up saying uh, cut. So when we have a cat cut problem, our listeners have a problem too. So that's an important sound to get right. In the classroom, the students could produce it, no problem. But when we got out of the classroom, they mostly went back to what they'd always been using, which was the cut sound. Um, and so we had that kind of issue. We had lots of meetings with the teachers. How could we do this better? We bought lots more textbooks. I wasn't happy with the whole thing. So along came COVID and our school closed down and it gave me the gift of time to reflect on what we were doing in our pronunciation course, to have a look around what, what was out there. 
How could we improve it and bring our English to life? Um, and I had a lot of sleepless nights at that time also. And so I had more gifts of time between like two and five in the morning. So like a lot of people, I jumped on my phone, I scrolled through things. And one night I happened to come across an interview given by Liz Bigler, who is a Colorvale trained teacher. She was talking about Colorvale. And it just made a lot of sense. So like Liz, I ran my own little language school. Like Liz, I taught Japanese students. But unlike Liz, I didn't have this great color valve system. And she was talking about the system that was working for her learners. So the next day I jumped onto Google and I watched some of the color valve videos and it just made sense to me. So I got wildly excited about this and I came across the North American English Colorvale chart. And in one of the Colorvale charts, you can click on the color and hear the sound. So that was great. I did that. And I got to green tea and silver pin and gray day, red pepper, black cat, all the same. It all matched. It was fantastic. And then I came to a grinding halt with this olive sock thing. So for me, it didn't fit. And my heart sank. Um, so being in New Zealand, we're often you, we have to use like British textbooks or American textbooks if we go textbook based. So I was happy to adapt. We, we are used to doing that kind of thing here. No problem. Uh, I continued on to Auburn. Auburn dog, and you can hear that in my accent, right? Auburn, or dog, or. Oh. So these aren't matching for me either. And then up to orange door, orange and door, or, oh, or. Oh. So here we came to grief a bit too. I thought, well, that's fine. Maybe I can push these around a bit, change it up. But I didn't have the confidence to do that. And I also had this extra sound, this tomato, ah, oh, sound, the ah. Oh. Where was I going to put that in this whole thing? So before long, I came across the Commonwealth edition of the Color Val chart, and it was happy days. So this chart matches my um, vowel sounds beautifully. So I had my tomato cart, I had my olive bottle, I had my auburn fawn, and none of this orange door business. Uh, so this is the chart that. I use and it's a very happy marriage for me. So I took the basic course and I think very shortly, um, even while I was doing the course, I started using it with my online students. So here you can see a picture from one of the textbooks. So I was contracted to work with these students and they happen to be all Japanese as well. And um, they had textbooks. So I told them, well, here, here was how vocab was introduced in their textbook. So it was listen, read the words, listen again and say the words. So we heard each word twice. Um, and I don't know about you as teachers, but this kind of thing bores me. It drives me crazy. It's, it's ghastly. But once I came across color vowel, um, it gave me a chance to change things up a bit. And so I got my students to shut their books. I took a photo of the uh, bear book and I changed it up. I got rid of all these uh, words here. And you can see I've got all these jazzy color vowel symbols down the side. So now we're just left with pictures. We've got no writing, so our eyes aren't interfering with anything there. Okay, so here's where you're going to help me. Um, we're going to take this picture here. All right. Can you, in your chat box, tell me um, what... And I've actually lost the chat box, I'm sorry. So can somebody help me here? Lost my chat box. 
if you press escape, you might be, then you'll you'll uh, minimize your screen and then you'll should be able to find it. You should be able to find it if I oh I've lost my screen. Oh I'm not going to do that. <laughs> oh my oh charming. <laughs> Sorry guys. Uh, oh one thing God. I can do for you, Lisa, is we can stop share for a moment while you get your bearings. Let's see if we can do that. And um, there we go. Here we go. I've got me back, but I yeah. haven't got my screen back, my share screen. Yeah. So now you can try share screen and I think you'll find it again. There you go. Okay. But I haven't got my chat box. Sorry. Okay. I was wanting participants to be able to participate. So sorry about that. Okay, I'm just going to box on because I might be running out of time. Oh, you're doing great. Um, I'm happy to <laughs> read to you what people write, if that's a help. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so we're looking at this thing here. Any suggestions? What do you think it is? Yeah, so some folks have said Auburn dog strawberry. Um, olive okay. Stock, uh, strawberry. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so let's work with strawberry so say um my learner said okay strawberry so i say to them okay strawberry strawberry where's the stress in strawberry so can you help me out where's that stress in the word strawberry right a uh, straw that's their answer straw oh, straw brilliant okay so now from that stress straw we're going to try and extract the vowel sound. Straw or or. What is the vowel sound there? And do we have choices? Can we? Uh, I think I see fawn, Auburn fawn. Uh, Lisa's accent sounds like orange door for strawberry. That's a, a comment. Um, again, remember everybody, you're going to perceive through your own vowel inventory. And so what you hear is actually different from what Lisa perceives herself as saying and doing. So, so somebody wrote yeah. olive bottle. Is it olive bottle for you? Is it? Okay. So interesting. So let's try that. So olive bottle or strawberry. So that you can understand it, but for me, it sounds really weird. I have to kind of think quite hard to pr pr <laughs> produce that. So strawberry for me is auburn fawn or strawberry. Okay, and with with my with my learners, we've all gone through the color vowel chart, so they're looking at this and they're testing it out. They're trying to match the or sound to one of these colors, and so we're really messing around with it. We're playing around with it. The students are discovering it, and there's lots of stuff going on in their brains. So much more than going back to the textbook with the script and saying, okay. Strawberry, repeat after me, strawberry. So can you see the difference? We're bringing it to life here. We're using it, we're playing around with it. We might be discovering that different people say it different ways, that's perfectly fine. You might be hearing orange door, that's not what I'm hearing, but we still understand what this thing is. It's a strawberry. Um, and I and it's, it's gonna make that word stick for them. So, and we can even then put our little auburn fawn, up here. Um, typically, I would um, start, let's have a look at this word. I would print it out for them on their screen, if I can insert something here. Let's have a look. Here's my text box. Okay, so um, perhaps we've got strawberry. And we're going to, first thing we do is we ID the stress in it. So we've got that or sound. Okay. And then under that, we've got our color, open. So in their vocabulary books, or their, uh, yeah, in their vocabulary books, they have got the spelling of it. They have got the stress it's with a little S there and it's not going to work for me. Um, and they've got the color. And that's what you need when you're learning a word, isn't it? You need to know the meaning of it. You need to know the spelling of it. You need to know where the stress is at. You need to know how to pronounce that stressed vowel, all of that. And then you need to know how to use it. So there's a whole lot that goes into learning just one word, right? 
Um, and then if they have a color valve organizer, um, they can put it into that. So it's going to be reviewed. Um, and so I think I'll probably leave it there. I did have one more thing that I was going to do, but I'm running out of time. So I think perhaps if we switch over to questions now, would that be a good yeah. thing to do? No, I think okay. absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's fascinating to me um, that you can, what's beautiful about having Auburn phone, Auburn phone and Auburn dog is that we can all use that Auburn reference and it often will, or often <laughs> uh, will serve uh, the purpose. Um, but if any of you are confused as to why Lisa needs um, olive bottle as opposed to, sorry, olive bottle as opposed to olive bottle, um, and why these changes are necessary, we only need to hear from a few of our Commonwealth speakers um, to let us know that this, in fact, is an important distinction. Um, meaning, even though we don't all understand exactly why these sounds are different, what's important is that the teacher is anchored securely and confidently with her chart. And that's what I've heard from Lisa time and again, is that feeling of coming home when she found that Commonwealth color vowel chart. Okay, uh, a nice uh, conversation here. Um, so it's lovely listening to your experience. This is coming from um, um, Fong, I think, and I'm going to guess, I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Um, he says, "I do you teach all of the color words on the first day um, all at once? That would be a question for you. What do you, Lisa? Yes. Yes, I do. So um, I've got face-to-face -face students coming um, just after Easter in April. And yeah, we're just going to go through it, the whole thing. Um, and they're not, it's not going to be perfect. They're not going to be able to pronounce all these sounds perfectly, but that's okay. They've just got that base. They've got an awareness. It's a, it's a point to jump off from. So, mm -hmm. so we do. And then each day we will be going through it. Um, and then if if we'll probably get stuck in around the black cat, we'll have to have a look at that. Um, and in around here with the the ooh and the oh, the wooden hook oh. Um, so some some of it we will have to dig deeper into how we're going to make those sounds, where where our jaws at, where our mouths at, where our tongues at, all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, and I haven't had a problem with it. Um, the students don't sort of, we don't just do one color a day or anything like that. We're just going to get straight into it and just get all messy and, and yeah, hop right in. Wonderful. Lisa, I, I recall you saying that you, one of your first lessons involves um, matching your, these girls who come to you, uh, they come for instruction with their host families. Can you tell yes. everybody a little bit about how you use ColorVal in introducing these young learners or these young adult learners to their families and how they get to know each other? Sure. So that was actually my last um, slide. This is what we used to do. Um, we used to just they'd write the names of their host families on this piece of paper. Um, and they I would listen to how they pronounced it and just correct them. So a student might say, my host mom's name is Anthea. And I would say, no, it's Anthea. The learner, Anthea. Me, no, Anthea. And by that time, they were nervous and stressed and the class was focusing on this poor kid. And as a teacher, you feel that tension. And you say, oh, say it one more time. So the student says, Anthea. And I would say, oh, OK, well, that's getting better. Keep practicing. But of course, it wasn't. You just wanted to get the attention off that poor student. So what we're doing now, they're doing the same thing. So we go through the color vowel chart. They're going to write the, the names of their family on the paper. So I've got my name here, Lisa. We're going to identify where the, where's the stress at, Lisa, and we'll underline that vowel. And then we're going to find, well, what color is it? And we're going to mess around with it. And we're going to find out that it's green. Yeah, green, T, E. Lisa. And so they're going to do that with all their family members. Um, and they may not get it right. But as the days and weeks and months go on, because we've got that awareness of the color chart, 
Maybe each day in news, the student whose host mum is called Anthea suddenly clicks, you know what? It's black cat air. It's black cat air Anthea. So with this, she's got a much better chance of getting the correct vowel sound than she did here. And that's what really excites me because that is bringing English to life. It's not going to happen suddenly. The vowel chart is giving my students the chance for that awareness and to working on it. And that 45 minute lesson is gone. We've got a vowel chart in our classroom that will be referred to any time. It's just kind of simmering away in the background. We're using it when we need it, not just for 45 minutes once a week. It's always there. And that's what I love about it. Wonderful. Thank you. I think what you're saying is really resonating with our audience. We've got a lot of teachers um, pitching in with their perspectives that build on this, Lisa. Um, and so we could each, if we were spending the day together, everybody, um, and we'll go ahead and stop share on your on your video, Lisa, if you don't mind. Um, sure. We could spend our, our moment here uh, figuring out the names, the colors of our own names, for example. Everybody in this room has a name. They have probably a first and a last name. And each of those words have a stress syllable. And each of those stress syllables have a vowel sound that we can categorize by color on one or the other chart or both, right? So I could be Karen, black cat, Karen, just as Lisa is Lisa and not Lisa. Lisa is a green T word. And so it's just, it's, it lights up immediately. And that's part of why we would use the whole chart because somebody in this room might have a name that falls, oh my gosh, I haven't taught that color vowel yet. We can't talk about your name yet. Uh, we, we don't wanna be in that position. Every word of English needs to be a valid word in the classroom if the learner brings it up. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Lisa, for your insights and for sharing a bit about your journey. Uh, we appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah. I'd like to uh, invite Gemma to the floor. Hi, Gemma. Hello. Gemma has Hi. joined us a very sort of similar. We've done a lot of meeting each other during pandemic and just after. Um, Gemma, can you tell us a little bit about your story with Color Vowel and as a teacher? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I actually came across Color Vowel about 10 years ago, uh, about 2013. And um, I'm a, a Scottish teacher of English. I'm based in Scotland. And I just assume this is just something else that will not work for me. It's something else that only provides American English. Um, so I didn't, you know, I put it to one side and forgot about it. Um, but luckily, <laughs> luckily, several years later, I, I happened across it again. And I, I started to play around with it. I hadn't taken any classes with Color Vowel, but I started to play around with it. And I started to really want to know the knack. I wanted to know more because I saw little glimpses of wonderful things happened whenever I used it. So as uh, same with Lisa, when the pandemic happened, I, I joined up some of the courses, some of the classes online and the rest is history. Here I am. <laughs> Shall I share my screen, Karen? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Can you see that all right? Oh. Can you see that okay, Karen? Yeah. Yes, it looks good. Thank you, Gemma. Okay. So yes, as I said, my name is Gemma. I am based in Scotland, in the west coast of Scotland. I am an EAP teacher, so I teach English for academic purposes and I'm also a programme coordinator at the English Language Unit at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. And um, as I said, came across the chart, but didn't think it was for me. And then in the last couple of years, I have found the knack, I've joined up to classes, and um, really learned how I can implement this in my classroom successfully. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm just going to talk about um, three ways that I use the chart uh, based in Scotland and using the Commonwealth version. And I'm going to also share with you three examples um, which have come directly from my students um, through the use of the chart and um, sometimes I got to see these wonderful light bulb moments happening so I'm looking forward to, to sharing them with you. 
All right. A little bit about my teaching context, first of all. Um, I see a couple of people here I know who are in Glasgow, so you'll know this very well also. Um, when students come to study at our university or really uh, in many of the different universities in the United Kingdom, they often have this uh, perception that they are going to be hearing the Queen's English. They assume that that is spoken all over the UK um, and that's what they're going to hear. And they're happy with that because that's what they have been trained with. All of the years that they have been learning English, they've been learning standard British English, this BBC English, Queen's English, or general American English. And then they get here and they have this enormous shock. <laughs> they they step off of the plane, they, they go through customs, they try to communicate in a taxi, and suddenly they realise this is not what I am used to. This is not the English that I have ever heard before. And just to give you a, a, a glimpse into what I mean by different Englishes, um, they're hearing a lot of diversity. In, in Glasgow in particular. Um, in the university where I work, we have uh, 23,000 students from over 100 different countries. We have staff representing 77 different nationalities. And in some departments, that is up to 50% international. <clears throat> so in the university context, students are really exposed to a lot of different voices and a lot of unfamiliar accents. This doesn't end when they leave the classroom, however, in fact, it only increases. When they leave the classroom and they start to communicate with local people, the diversity increases. In Scotland, uh, we have four official languages. We have Scottish Standard English, which is what I'm speaking now. We have um, Scottish Gaelic, we have British Sign Language, and we also have the Scots language. So we have four different languages within those that are different regional accents. And I've put down here in my last point, SSE. What I mean by that is Scottish Standard English. There are many differences in the sounds of Scottish Standard English compared with SBE, Standard British English, and GA, General American. So a lot of new sounds, a lot of different voices, and that all comes at them all at once, which can be really overwhelming and shocking for many students. But luckily, the colour vowel chart is a really uh, intuitive way to explain and to explore these different sounds. So I'm going to show you some of the ways that I have been using it with my students. When I'm using the chart, um, like Lisa, like many of the colour vowel trained teachers here today, one of the ways I do that is to do a, a warm up using the chart. And that's when we go through all of the sounds individually in the chart and we say the phrase and the sounds. For example, green tea, e, silver pen, e, eh, and we go through the whole chart. The Commonwealth uh, vowel chart is very, very helpful for me, but it's not a perfect fit. Neither chart is a perfect fit for a Scottish English speaker. And what my students start to notice is after they have gone through a couple of warm ups using the chart, they start to notice some things. And one of the things they notice is that for a Scottish speaker, some of the sounds are the same. And they include olive and auburn. These are merged in Scottish English into one sound. So by going through the warm up, eventually they start to think, hang on a minute, they sound really similar. They sound the same. What's happening there? They also notice another example of merging in Scottish English with wooden and blue. They have the oo sound, exactly the same for Scottish speakers, um, but these are two separate sounds for speakers of most other accents. So just by going through a warm-up activity with students, I'm creating opportunities where I can start to increase the discussion about different pronunciations 
what they're hearing in the classroom versus what they're hearing outside of the classroom or before they came to Scotland to begin their studies. Um, I think this is incredibly valuable because you probably know this yourself in your own teaching materials that maybe you've been assigned to use. There is very little diversity in our teaching resources, very little. And we as teachers have to bring in and create these moments to start the discussion about normalising different pronunciations. Um, so the colour vowel chart is a great way to facilitate students discovering about different accents. It's also a great way to personalise as well. Now, I do not teach an accent. I teach pronunciation purely for uh, clarity and international intelligibility. Um, but if I know that my students have a very particular goal, sometimes I'm able to point out differences in the chart based on that accent goal they might have. For example, at the moment, I have a student who uh, they are trying very hard to get into broadcasting. And he desperately wants to develop a, a standard British English accent. He knows he doesn't have to have it. He knows it's not necessary, but he just really wants to work towards this. So that means that when we're going through the chart, I can point out to him when I'm saying something using the black cat ah vowel, where a standard British English speaker might say the tomato cart ah sound. So for example, black cat path, for myself would be tomato cart ah for ah path for a standard British English speaker. So I can I can personalize points in the chart based on students' goals and their the, the accent that they're working towards. That's unusual. It's unusual to have students with something that specific, but it shows the flexibility of how you can use the chart to meet your students' needs. Um, but one of the things that I enjoy the most and reflects this picture here is using the chart to allow students to connect the dots between what's happening in the classroom and what they're hearing outside of the classroom. And I'm going to share with you uh, a wonderful story that happened last year. I had a student in my class and we were we were working on the sound, uh, the, the brown cow sound. We stopped for a minute to talk about it. You might notice that for me, brown cow ow is a little bit different to what it is for you. In a standard British English or a general American English brown cow sound, it starts somewhere around black and moves up to blue, ow, like that. For me, it's a little bit higher, starting around red and then moving into the middle, ow, 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 like that. <clears throat> What my student, we were having this discussion and then I was giving students time to um, to actually practice using the brown cow vowel and it came to one student's uh, opportunity to, to say the brown cow sound or, or word and he stopped, he stopped dead before he even had his chance to speak and he told us this story and he said I had to go to um, a minor injuries unit at the hospital this week and this is just simply um, a medical service for non-emergency medical needs when your normal doctor is closed. Like if you if you cut yourself or if you burn yourself cooking, you don't go to accident and emergency, you go to the, the out of hours or the minor injuries unit. Anyway, this student was, was wandering around the hospital campus trying to find the out of hours service. And he got lost, he couldn't find his way. And he asked someone about minor injuries. And the speaker said, oh, you mean Utavurs, Utavurs. <laughs> My student, you know, nodded and smiled, not having a clue what he just heard. But he remembered this at the point when we were talking about brown cow. And using the chart, what we were able to do is say, well, for a, a Scottish standard English speaker, yes, out of hours is brown cow out of hours. But if you're speaking to someone who is actually using the Scots language, not Scottish standard English, brown cow turns to blue moon oo, oot of oors, blue moon oot of oors. 
<laughs> so this was this wonderful light bulb moment. I had not spoken to him about this. He was able to connect the dots in real time just because we facilitated that knowledge using the chart. And it was the most wonderful thing to watch. And, um, and of course, we can then say, well, if you have a similar experience, you're going to know what's going on. So for example, let's let's try on another brown cow word. What about the word house? Stay muted, everyone keep your microphones closed. Try and say brown cow house with the blue moon ooh vowel. Try that now. <laughs> blue moon hoose. Or even the word mouse, brown cow mouse. Can you make that blue? Blue moon moose. <laughs> so it's just a little example of how we can expand their awareness of these different languages, different accents in their local linguistic community. And the, the chart facilitated this completely organically with, with no preparation at all. A second way that I use the chart is to help provide explanations of oral observations. And this is when students come in to me and say, I had this experience, I heard someone talking, and I had no idea what they were saying, can you help me? So this time they're coming to me directly for help. In the first image here, uh, a student had been in the supermarket going through the checkout, and the checkout assistant had tried to alert them to a two for one offer, you know, buy one, get one free. But again, she wasn't really using Scottish Standard English like me, she'd moved into Scots. And the word for one in Glaswegian Scots is actually one. So she'd said to the student, it's two for one, two for one. And the student, not expecting this different pronunciation, really just kind of fell apart and didn't know what was happening. But when he came into the classroom, we can actually say, you were expecting a cup of mustard one, but what you heard was a, a local variation where they changed that to black cat one. So they get to see this visual, they have this memory of the, the, the color. Um, and if you want to, if you're able to, you can also go into the mechanics of it, how the mouth changes from a cup of mustard to black cat. So there's all sorts of opportunities. Another time uh, a student was telling me about overhearing some of the cleaning staff in his accommodation um, and they, he, he, didn't, he wasn't sure exactly what he was hearing. He was hearing them talking about world, the world and the guttle. And what we were able to explain or what I was able to show him is that sometimes in Scotland we put a little mustard sound between the R and the L, this little extra mustard sound. World, 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 world. Girl, 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 girl. So again, just using the, the chart to facilitate that understanding. It's this extra mustard sound which is changing it from what you expect. I'm now going to move on to the last thing that I uh, use the colour vowel chart for, and this is for listening to coding. And what I mean by that is trying to help students get a bottom up understanding of what they're hearing in natural speech. So if, if students hear something unexpected, maybe during a listening exercise or maybe from me in the early days when they're not used to me, and they, they say, well, well, what was that? Is that OK? Is that the right pronunciation? Um, I, I like to go through these questions with them. So, well, what did you hear? Try and describe it for me. Uh, why do you think the speaker pronounced that that way? Is that OK? Did you did you understand that? Is it still OK to say it in that way? Do you know of any other way to pronounce that word? And if you have an example, you can try on, like what we did with brown cow and blue moon, we can try on different colours to see if something is easy for us to say, if we still understand it easily, 
um, just to, to, to help them um, realize and, and gain awareness of different sounds and different accents being okay. They don't have to worry if, if they're hearing a different accent, that is actually normal. So an example of this um, comes from this word here, this word in Scotland can be pronounced two ways. Similar to general American, it could be pronounced purple shirt person. But sometimes the ER in Scotland is actually pronounced with a red pepper vowel, red pepper person. And if students notice that and comment on it, as I said, we can just go through the questions. So what did you hear? Okay, we, we, said pers we, we said person, but with the red pepper sound. Why did they pronounce it that way? It's just an accent um, variation. Is it okay? Well, did you understand me when I said person? If you did, great. So, and then they can try it on. Why don't you try it on right now? Try saying red pepper person or purple shirt person. How comfortable does that feel? <laughs> Maybe it doesn't feel comfortable for you and that's okay. Um, I always say to students, say the, the version that you feel comfortable with. If something feels comfortable for you, if we can understand you, then that's all you need to do. i am come to the end now, so I'm just going to stop uh, uh, by commenting finally on um, how colour vowel is so useful for us as teachers. I've spoken about how I can use it for students. What about teachers? Um, like Lisa, um, I've gained a lot from joining the colour vowel programme, going through all the different courses. But one of the most important things for me is how I've learned more about other varieties of English as well as my own. This ability to compare and contrast um, you know, how do we say it in New Zealand? How do we say it in North America or Canada or Japan or Scotland? Um, that's incredibly uh, useful and rich. You learn from your classmates, from your tutors and from the different charts. So it's it's an incredibly useful and um, wonderful experience to go through as a professional. And finally, um, when you learn about the chart and about the different features of the chart, you become aware of ways that you can use the chart to help students um, to cope, to comprehend with these different sounds, these different varieties that they are less familiar with. So you can point these out, you can compare and contrast different varieties um, to give students that experience that they may not be getting anywhere else. And that is me in a nutshell, everyone. So thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope that was interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gemma. This is very interesting. I mean, how many of us teach in diverse contexts where our learners need to understand not just us, you know, they always under, they say, teacher, I understand you so well. Thank you. And then they walk out of the room and they have to interact with people of all kinds. And um, what are we doing if we're setting them up to judge those others as incomprehensible? And that often is the outcome, is our students will go out and say, well, I have to talk to these people at work, but they don't speak very good English. I like your English teacher. And that's always been a bit troubling to me. And you've really shined a light on that, Gemma, uh, that idea that we're preparing our students to understand not just us, but and not just people who sound like us, but all kinds of English speakers. If we can find the, uh, if we can build that capacity to notice sound. I love the Udavura story so much. <laughs> Um, questions for Gemma. If you have a question now, a very specific one just for Gemma, this is a great time for that. Any questions for Gemma? <laughs> Lots of comments in the chat, by the way. I think people really enjoyed trying on different colors. This is something we do a <laughs> lot. Um, if we, as people think about their questions, I'll spend just a moment um, with that trying on concept, everybody. We can even just do it right here with the chart for ourselves so easily. Take the word white for just a moment, white, white. And I'd like you to now say the word white, just that word. I'd like you to say it with um, a, a gray sound, white. But I want you to think of the color, white, okay? Now say, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a weight wall, a weight wall. 
And does that still does that feel interesting? <laughs> and now change it from a weight wall or a white wall. Make it turquoise. Oh, how does it sound? White, white, <laughs> white wall. I painted a white wall, right? So you can start to turn just in your mind already kind of pluck these different strings of accent and accentedness and realize this is merely a matter of colors. And it, when we have the chart, we can talk in those kind of neutral ways of simply changing color, or I wasn't expecting that color. And we can step away from the typical tropes of, oh, well, they don't speak very well, or this group over here, they, they mumble, or whatever kinds of ways uh, we disparage uh, other Englishes as a society. Um, we, we don't have to be doing that any longer because we have a better tool. Okay. Um, questions that I've seen come up. Um, let's see. Uh, do you find it difficult? Let's see. Presenting differences of sound. I'm just trying to look through here. I just want to say there's just a lot of excitement over here, and I'm not seeing specific questions for the moment, but you can save these for our panel discussion. And I want to thank Gemma uh, for her time. Thank you, Gemma. Okay. Um, along those lines, as I start to introduce our third panelist, Claire, um, I, some of you have been asking about training, and we've been sharing that over in the chat. Um, do know that we, you know, teachers start off in our level one training program, and we have two courses that come together as a bundle for that experience. So that allows a, a toe in the water kind of experience. Um, toe in the water, meaning it's you don't have to worry about uh, getting a submerged. You can just stick your toe in and take that six hour asynchronous self paced course called Basics. Um, this is over at learn.colorval.com. Um, so basics is on your own time. It's a series of videos that I've recorded for you uh, with everything you need to know about the basic approach. So it's very comprehensive with some um, self-guided quizzes and so forth. You also, by the way, gain access to Blue Canoe Premium, which is our app for learners, our pronunciation app. Um, along with that, to finish out the level one training experience is our live technique practicum here on the right. And that is a series of five online sessions over the course of five weeks. We provide you with uh, six hours of practice where we give you tasks and you practice those through a video dialogue with your coach. We provide personalized feedback. And through that, you will receive the ColorVal digital image kit that you've seen a bit of today. Um, so all of these, when you see these images being used, all of these are included in the digital image kit um, with some opportunities to use those in your own materials for, for teaching purposes. Okay, so that's just a bit about what you're seeing when Jennifer has been posting that link to learn.colorval.com. And I wanted to let you know about that. Great. Um, I'd like to now introduce our third and final panelist for the day. Uh, Claire Schneider is an ESL teacher in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, as Claire is about to tell us, she's from a couple of other different places and brings a world of travel and experience to the table when it comes to figuring out how she speaks and where she speaks that way. Um, so, and it's fun because Claire just returned from uh, quite a bit of travel. I hope you'll include a little bit about your your insights about how you spoke in different places, Claire, because that was fascinating during our preparation session yesterday. Um, so hello, Claire. Welcome. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Let's do that. That'll be a good start. Hello again, everyone. This is Claire. Thanks for the introduction, Claire. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'll start by explaining a little bit about my history with the chart, which goes back a long time. Karen, you might remember more precisely the year, but it's more than 10 years when I first heard you give a presentation. Is that correct? That was about 2011, something like that. Yeah. Yes. Karen presented um, at our New Mexico TESOL conference uh, here in the United States. And I was a very intrigued right from the beginning. At a similar time, I was... Uh, doing my training to become a TESOL instructor. And um, I, you know, just kept in touch with Karen and any programs that she was running um, in New Mexico. And very soon thereafter, she actually became the head of our program at the community college, um, a program that works, works with uh, immigrants uh, to the United States 
in adult education. And she actually gave me my very first job, for which I'm very grateful. Um, and another real advantage of that was that Karen trained all of us uh, in the Calaval method. Uh, I hadn't, I didn't really have any competition, except I suppose you could say the International Phonetic Alphabet, um, which I thought was really a complicated system. And I was very happen, uh, happy to completely abandon that. Uh, you're welcome to, you know, give an emoji or a, a hand signal if you're also happy not to use that, that uh, system. I know my students are very happy not to have to do that anymore. Um, so that's how I got introduced to it, and I've been using it ever since, and as the other speakers have, have mentioned, it's just always here, whether students are in my classroom, I have two on different walls, um, or online, and it's fully integrated, so I do use, you know, certain methods and sort of strategies at certain times, but it's fully integrated into my program during every lesson. Um, to my next slide. Hmm. Let me see. Maybe I was not moving to my next slide for some reason. We can see your mouse. Yeah. Why is it not moving to the next? Oh, there we go. There you go. I don't know. Just got a little bit stuck. Um. Wait for my slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. So yes, um, when we were talking about different kinds of Englishes, I suppose I would uh, definitely describe mine as global English. And that's because I've lived in these different countries. Uh, and so each country you know, that we live in and to some extent even visit, I think can affect our accent over time. So um, just to keep it brief, I grew up in South Africa. Um, my parents were British. And uh, I also lived in the UK as a young child and a young adult. I spent a lot of time in Singapore, uh, some years in Switzerland, and then I moved to the United States about 22 years ago. So in each of these countries, I also learned another language um, to help me feel connected to that country that I was living in. And I think over time that probably does affect our accents. Um, that being said, because I was in different countries and because English is often the common language in all these countries, um, I was always probably trying to sound as close as possible to something that would be generally recognized as a sort of standard English, you could say. And that's quite a broad term, but um, I, I think that it just happened naturally. Um, so when I moved to the United States, I did run into some problems um, as a native speaker. And my problem started with saying my name. Mm. So prior to moving to the United States, I would say my name is Claire. And those of you that are British or familiar with British varieties will recognize that as being the common way to say my name. However, in the United States, people would say, excuse me, and I'd say it again, excuse me. And then they'd ask me to spell it. And once I spelled it, they would say, oh, Claire. So I started to say my name, Claire. And it's probably not a huge difference, but it's different enough that it really threw people off. And so I encountered other words like that over time that I had to learn to say a little differently so that it was less frustrating for me and less frustrating for the listener. And, uh, and then when I became a, an English instructor uh, and I was using the Calaval chart, I had to make some, well, I wanted to make some more modifications. So instead of saying, I can't speak Japanese, I now say, I can't speak Japanese. And my children were sort of horrified for a while because our accent is so much part of our identity. But first of all, I thought it was fun to try on a different hat. And I said, this just makes sense. My students are going to hear me and it's going to have some impact. I can't sound American, North American. As you were saying, Karen, you know, we, we can only teach to some extent from the accent that we, that we have, that we bring to the table. 
Um, but I can change my, my certain vowel sounds. And so I do that um, with, yes, specifically with black cat. And then also um, I highlight for students certain sounds that I think on the chart are the most important to be able to pronounce correctly or more or less correctly if you're in the United States, such as olive sock. That is a defining North American uh, vowel sound that is quite different from the Commonwealth version. So if they have had a British uh, teacher or someone with a, a more British-like variety of English and from another country, and they want to keep saying doctor, doctor, I say that's fine. If people understand you in the United States saying doctor, it's, it's okay. But if you start running into problems, just know that most people would say that as doctor and you know we'll practice how to pronounce that sound and then the other defining really important sound i think in terms of the chart is purple shirt because that r that little r at the end makes a huge difference and then i'm getting a little bit off my notes but it's okay um i think i'm staying a little bit longer on accent um because you might have noticed this when, if you're speaking another language and you know, if our accent is unusual, quite unusual and differs a fair amount from the normal accent, people get fatigued listening to us. And I've had that experience too, listening to someone who's speaking English, advanced English with complicated structures, maybe they're explaining abstract thoughts, critical thinking is involved, if their accent is just too sort of, I don't know if heavy is the right word because that sounds negative, differs too much from what's more widely uh, intelligible, generally intelligible, I get really fatigued. And this is what I remind my students that, you know, you, if, it's, if you're not speaking that clearly, you might be able to get away with it for a while, but the listener might get tired and then sort of glaze over and then they start asking you to repeat and things like that. So it's worth considering, um, you know, how we can kind of maintain that accent that is going to be more um, recognizable. I also tell them that sometimes it's not their fault. So um, I don't know if other teachers have found this, but certainly I found this in the United States. Some, and this is not a, a, a sort of a, a, to really give a jab to people in North America, but this is just from my experience. And, have, and I have the fortune of having been to other countries, but some people that we encounter might not have had that background. And so if we don't say it in a fairly similar way to the way they say it, they might not understand. And another person might understand you perfectly when you say that same word. It just depends on their background and what accent they have and what they're used to and their tolerance for hearing people who speak a little differently. And I do that to say, to sort of encourage them and to say that it's not always your fault. Um, anyway, moving on from that, um, just to run through, oh, I think I forgot to set my timer, so please remind me if something I'm going on too long. About, about, five, about five to seven more minutes, you're good. Okay, good. So um, this is a picture of um, my class at the community college. And so, okay, I just, I just said something. I just said class instead of class. And Karen was mentioning this. I came back from South Africa where I was uh, visiting my mother and my sister for three weeks. And I've noticed myself that, I'm, that I switched back to saying things like can't or chance. And now that I've come back, I'm hearing myself, I haven't completely switched back to saying chance and can't. And it's just, it's a way to entertain myself. And I just notice it, but anyway. Um, that's my mom in the middle. She's a speech and drama teacher. We were doing something on Reader's Theatre, and uh, that was she came to help me hang out in the class. Class, I got it that time. Class, not class. Um, so when I was at the college, we started a program to take the students out of the classroom to practice English in real world situations, and that gave me the idea to my own language school. So I started doing this um, in 2017. I called it Language Matters. And this is just some pictures of some of my students. This is actually outside my house, which is where my classroom is. And um, 
that was pretty, not long before COVID. So I did have students and it was tremendous fun going to museums, farmers markets, uh, concerts and all kinds of things. But then during COVID, I had to switch to online teaching. And so most of my online, stu online students were Japanese, were professional Japanese expats. They live in the United States. And, you know, those of you that have taken the courses um, and who will take courses on uh, Colaval, you will learn so many different techniques and methods. Um, and it's beyond the scope of this session to really go into many of them. So I'm just going to show one that I do, one of many. Um, and fortunately, uh, Gemma and Lisa and Karen have shown us some others. Um, so this is the Colaval organizer. And I think I'm blocking my screen with this, right? That's better. It, it looks good to us. We oh, okay. Yeah. And so this is a student who has, uh, who's very well educated, Japanese gentleman, uh, has degrees from Japan and from the United States. And we were working on Kalevals. So this is his Kalaval organizer. And just to make it a bit clearer, um, I took a screenshot of the gray day words. So when words come up during class with a student like this, um, if he mispronounces something, then I'll ask him to, you know, correct it. Where does he think the stress should be? Which syllable? We go through various steps and I um, support him while he figures out where it should go. And then he adds it to his uh, color in the, in the correct place. So um, over time, you know, the students gather multiple words and it's interesting to see that, for instance, with this student, he didn't have trouble with white tie and it looks like wooden hook, but that would be a little bit unusual. Um, perhaps I took a, a shot of this before we really completed the chart and he completed his program, but he seemed to have a lot of words in the black area, quite a few in gray um, and olive. And then what I also noticed is um, that he sometimes would make some errors in his, even after we had discussed it and I would put it in his session notes, he, when he wrote it in his document, he sometimes would you know, not quite underline it in the right spot. So over here, he, he should really just have done uh, the line under the eye. And, um, and then what about this word vegetarian? vegetarian. Okay, so that, you know, from my uh, point of view, I would view that as an inaccuracy. It might be accurate for some people, Vege vegetarian. Maybe you could put in the chat if you would, if you would think that's gray, vegetarian. And, you know, if he says vegetarian, I think that most people probably would understand him. But we discussed it as a red word. Yeah. So any any gray vegetarians out there? <laughs> I see a lot of reds in the in the room that are responding with red. Um, but I red. think it's certainly a lot of our Southern uh, American English speakers might find it to be gray vegetarian. That's yes. possible. So it's one of it's an example that reminds us that you know maybe we don't always have to be so strict. You know it's it's close to um, you know it's close to red. It's just right over here that so these lines, they're solid lines, but you know, maybe we could think of them as being more like dotted lines because they're, they're quite fluid and some words could be sort of in between or like that word you showed us, Karen, that was straddling multiple colors. You know, we need to let our students know that it's, it's quite sort of nuanced. It's not really black or white always. This is just a framework, framework or a guideline to increase awareness and help them organize their words. Um, I think I'm probably about up for time, so I'll just go to. Well, and I'll I'll add what's fascinating there is is vegetarian, vegetarian, vegetarian. All of those touch each other on the chart, and are are neighbors, let's say, and they are neighbors in the mouth space. Um, but mm -hmm. notice what they're not. So, you know, Claire, if he had come to you with a vegetarian in uh, the blue box, would you call that a necessary correction? Yes, so when it's more extreme like that, then we have to, yeah, you know, we have to, you know, let them practice, maybe go through the motions of saying that word and how would it sound if it's an ooh word, and then let them discover it themselves. Like, oh, 
oh, that, that sounds very, very different. Like, yeah, no way. <laughs> Wonderful. But, but it also makes it fun. It's, it's fun to do that. So, yeah, thank you. I hope there, there were some interesting um, ideas for you. Thank you, Claire. Wonderful. Um, every so many things have come up during uh, important ideas have come up during this panel, uh, and I know we have lots of questions. But one of those, as you start thinking about your questions for the panel, is the question of the standard. Uh, I think we've all heard reference and probably even used reference to a, a concept of standard English. Uh, maybe it feels comfortable, or um, maybe it feels entirely reasonable. And yet, I hope during this session, you've started to really question, what is the standard? Where does the standard come from? Um, other than a need for comfort that, that maybe I speak the standard, therefore I'm more comfortable being a teacher. Um, so I, I'm going to start with that question about standard. Of, is there a standard English? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I see some comments here, you know, it's neither overtly nor informal, uh, neither formal nor informal English uh, is what Aviva is referring it to as. And this, I think a lot of times the term standard often is referring to the most safe um, way to speak. That's sort of one, one way it's been poised. But now what we've been doing in this session today is think about the Udavurs moment that Gemma described, uh, the Udavurs and, and knowing in that moment, it really only involved those two people. That's what mattered completely, was this student and that individual in Scotland at that moment trying to get healthcare, right? And so the standard was, was defined by the two of them. That was the standard at that moment. That's one way I would think about this as a, in a new way. Uh, the standard is the context. The standard is the range of people that I'm likely to encounter or my student is. And so I, I wanted to see if our panelists, if we start opening up questions to the panel, um, if we have any thoughts from our panel about where they uh, feel this word standard falls. Is it like mine or are you thinking about it differently? And I'd like to um, welcome Gemma and Claire and Lisa back up to the, the table. By the way, I think I've made it possible for everybody to drag and organize the Zoom windows so that you can place people where you want them. And I've, I've placed Lisa, Gemma, and Claire at the top of my screen so I can look at the three of them. You might be able to do that as well, okay? Um, but what are your thoughts on, on the concept of standard these days, given what you do with the chart? Um, Gemma, can we, any thoughts from you? And, and then we'll just keep sharing ideas there. So historically, the standard was the, the variety that was the least regional. So the, the, the variety that had the least regional features. So um, certainly uh, nowadays, that, that's not a it's not something that we're having to measure ourselves up against. The UK, I mean, for a long, long time, uh, standard British English was the thing. And it's been named a lot of different names as well over the years, the Queen's English, BBC English. To me today, it's just a label, but it has a lot of meaning to some people. Some people very much dislike having to call something a standard or comparing themselves against a standard. Um, to me, it's nothing more than a label. It's lost that power for me as a kind of authority. Um, but certainly that's what it was historically. It was the least regional form. Today, that's not something that I'm trying to work towards and it's not something that most teachers are trying to work towards. Yeah. Other thoughts on standard? Lisa, any thoughts there? Yeah, well, being in New Zealand, um, New Zealand, the, the Europeans came to New Zealand and they wanted to keep, uh, most of them came from, from England, and they wanted to recreate a little England here in New Zealand, um, and they wanted to keep their English. So there's been some, um, there used to be lots of articles uh, long before I came along um, about how the New, Ze the New Zealand accent was slipping and it was getting slack and sounding less like British, which means that we were less, you know, people regarded Kiwis as less educated and um, and our news presenters all spoke this, I guess, standard English. But uh, as Gemma said, over the years, we've created our own identity. We've, we've definitely don't sound anything like the, the, the Queen's English these days. 
And also what's creeping into our New Zealand English here is lots and lots of Maori words. Um, so, you know, I would greet people as Kiora. I'm Lisa from Aotearoa, New Zealand. So we're really creating our own accent and we're becoming quite proud of that. So standard English has gone out, gone out the window. I really like this world English type thing. And again, it's that comprehensibility. So like Claire said, we're not, the listeners are not getting fatigued. That's the overall important thing here. It doesn't matter how you, how, you know, how you're going to pronounce it. And, and whether your English is, it has a bit of British English for some words or American English for others or whatever, um, that's not the important thing. It's to engage our listeners so that we can communicate easily. That's the, that's the really important thing I think that people are focusing on now. Wonderful. Claire, anything from you? Um, yes, it completely makes sense what both you, um, Lisa and Gemma were saying. I suppose I think of it more as, uh, from a personal point of view, I think I, I think of it as something that is maybe neutral, more neutral. Um, and that's probably because when I go to other countries where, say if I'm in India for a while, my daughter lived there and so I made trips there. And the common language even there seems to be in uh, English. You know, I would hear different people uh, from within the country using English because that was their common language. And I want to be understood in those situations too. So I think I do try maybe not uh, so obviously, I'm not so obviously conscious of it, but I think it's just a natural, it's been a natural development for me um, to try to speak so that I, so that I, so that most people can understand me. Yeah. It's not that it's, it's better or that, you know, so I, and I, uh, in terms of my accent, I think it's wonderful if someone has a distinctive regional accent, but I don't have one. And I don't know, you know, how people perceive me because when I was in South Africa the other day, some people said I sound American. In this part of the world, nobody thinks I'm from here. When I'm in the UK, British people know that I'm not British. So they just sort of are curious. They're sort of like, hmm. And so that's just how it is. Well, I'll add yeah, unique, at the time like that everybody I, else. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add at the time that I worked with Claire in New Mexico, um, you know, we could start just think, okay, I have a faculty of 20 people. They're all from different parts of the country. And I've got, you know, here's Claire from another country. And I think we had a couple of uh, many different accents. Do we need to worry about that? <laughs> if you're an administrator and you have a, a team, well, we really can't worry about that. We're all English teachers. And um, are we worried that, for example, learners will, will take one accent and, and not be able to do the other? And what will happen to the learner? Um, lucky for us, the brain is also playing an important role in all of this. And much of what the brain does is behind the scenes and under the covers uh, that we don't have a lot of control over. Um, so we can kind of remind ourselves that we can all speak the way we speak because the learner's brain is forming yet another accent of English, their accent. Um, yes, influenced by their first language, uh, but also a collection of their experiences, like Claire has described. Uh, that over here I say class and over there I say class because they they get me through different doorways in different places. And um, so we're really forming a kind of a flexible inventory of speech depending on where we go. Wonderful. We have some questions that have come up. And again, I'm, we're collecting these. Lynn's watching for these in the chat. Uh, we, we kind of have a list over here, but keep the questions coming. Um, we, if you want to raise a hand and really ask a question, you're welcome to raise a hand digitally. We'll look for that over there too. Um, I do have a question that Doug has raised. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, and this is for all three, is, is he said, do students with an overpowering or say a particularly, you know, we use words like overpowering, heavy, um, distinct accent in their first language. Um, when do they learn these new sounds so that an English speaker can understand their speech? Meaning, can the color vowel chart help a strongly accented learner of English? Um, and he added, I have a student with a really strong Haitian accent, for example. 
that makes it difficult. So is it helpful not only to you as a teacher, but is it helpful to your students? Um, and I'll, I'll start and go backward. Claire, is it helpful to your students who have pronunciation difficulties? Yes, definitely, because, you know, if we think of all the different aspects that are so important in order to speak clearly, um, I think that the stress and placing the, st the stress in the right place and with the, uh, a generally um, intelligible vowel sound, I think that's the most important aspect. So if they don't, you know, remember to um, reduce certain syllables and the intonation is a bit unusual or the language is choppy, they don't quite identify the thought groups clearly, all those things matter for fluency and sounding as if, you know, you have kind of a natural speech. But I think that the one thing that's the most important is getting the color vowel correct at the sound and in the right place. So it provide, provides a method to directly um, focus on that issue. Yeah. Yeah, those remind me of sort of the two questions we always have teachers ask, which is, you know, where's the stress? What color is it? Just two questions, you know, and then you can decide what the third one is, but the two really get them zoomed in on, on the comprehensibility piece. Thank you, Claire. Great. Any other thoughts on strongly accented students or students who are really difficult to understand for you, the teacher? For me, certainly, um, it's really important to remember that just because someone has a strong accent doesn't mean that they cannot be intelligible. And I think that um, it's important for everyone, not just English teachers, um, to, to realize that an accent does not necessarily make you you know, difficult to understand or, or unintelligible. But using, you know, what, what Claire mentioned earlier about the listening burden, um, sometimes listening to a very unfamiliar accent can be quite tiring for all of us. And I think what the chart does is that it brings the listener and the speaker together so that our students are aiming for a sound that is closer to the listener's expectation rather than our students just learning an accent. So it's, it's kind of bringing, bringing listener and speaker together when we use the chart so that everyone is kind of working off of the same, same page, basically, the same sound, the expectation and the production, if that makes sense. It does. And I, I want to piggyback on that. I, I think it's important to note, this is where the shape of the chart really comes in handy, because whether we're looking at, and you can see here in the windows, whether you're looking at my chart or the one behind Gemma, they are shaped in the same way because we all have mouths, frankly put. And we all have this thing in, in our face called a mouth with a hole in it. <laughs> and in there is a space with a tongue in there. And it can it, the tongue moves in that space for all of us. That's what's universal. And that's what's so exciting is whether we divide it into five sounds in the front, um, or six or four sounds in the back, the space is the same space. And the tongue is making its way, or the jaw is making it into a particular position to come up with a word, whether it's uh, class or class, uh, aunt or aunt, or you know, bag or bag, um, whatever our words are that we're using. And that's what allows us to be mutually comprehensible. So whether we're going to call this tomato or olive, uh, that's a matter of the tool for you, the teacher, and the what you're giving over to the learner. But in the end, they're learning the comprehensibility of the position. And that's pretty exciting that we're we're simply finding our way into this very inaccessible. It's so much a part of us, this mouth, this hole in our face with the tongue in there, um, that we are built not to notice it. and And the map helps us explore it in some manner uh, and with some accuracy for our experience. That's pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> I see a lot of dialogue over there in the chat. You know, I see some interest in uh, tomato cot and olive, uh, olive sock. So everyone try for just a minute as I pull up, I'm going to pull up my chart here. Um, here we go, right over here maybe. Um, I'd like you just to try the sounds actually for a moment. Um, and this this goes for everyone in the room. I just like you to open your jaw ah, 
and say, ah, okay, ah, and then try olive sock as if you were really trying to do it just like me, olive sock. And then tomato cot, tomato cot. And if you can feel yourself using for just the moment, using the same position for all four of those words, olive sock, tomato cot, you now know why you might want one of those to be yours rather than the other. So in the chat, which one is more comfortable when you actually are thinking about the word, you know, the meaning of an olive sock or a tomato cart? These are little strange images, but they're words in your language. So which one is yours? Are you olive sock or are you tomato cart? Tomato cart, suddenly I can sound posh. No, that's different. So for Lucy, it's tomato cot. And now we have a common point. So, so these are all occupying the same space. Um, I think Claire, no, who is it that has both charts? I think it's Lisa. Can you show us your slide that shows both charts right next to each other? Okay. And so I think that's important, everybody, that we have two ways of, of understanding um, what the charts are doing for us. That's right, that one right there, perfect. Um, is notice that olive sock in the North American chart occupies the same location as tomato cot. And, and while I, as an English speaker from California, would say tomato cart, um, I can recognize that tomato cot uh, uh, occupies the same space. Okay. And then if we move one over to Auburn dog, Auburn dog, not, not a sound of my dialect, so I'm kind of faking it here. Uh, it's just not a sound I have but Auburn dog, hold on to that. Say Auburn dog with a rounded lip, Auburn dog. And now move it over to olive bottle, olive bottle. And you can, you should be able to find a way where you can use the same lip and jaw position in both Auburn dog, olive bottle. And you'll start to feel yourself crossing accent varieties from Commonwealth to North American. And that just gives you a sense of, of how those work and, and why it is that um, tomato cot might not be comfortable um, for, in, for you in everyday English or olive sock may not work at all the way Lisa experienced. Okay, wonderful. We're, we're good with our time, everybody. We have time for questions. And with the folks in the room, I'm, I'm interested in hearing voices. It's uh, challenging to sift through you know, the chats and I'd like to see what floats to the top now as far as questions for our panelists, for, for all of us regarding color vowel, um, maybe what you're doing in your classroom and a question related to today's talk. There was a comment raised as again, as you're thinking and raising hands. Um, Gabby recently raised a really interesting question. Uh, and this, this gets into the power politics of accent and also the, the power of publishing and the role that plays in the concept of standard. She says in Mexico, many bilingual schools teach English as a second language and certify their students through the Cambridge exams. The study materials used in the classes and for the exam preparation are typically based on British English. So given that one of the primary goals of some of these schools is to have students certified by Cambridge, do you think it would be better for those schools to adopt and teach uh, with the Commonwealth version of the color vowel chart? Let me paint this in a slightly more, uh, you know, very focused kind of question. If you were coordinating a program in Mexico aimed at preparing students for the Cambridge exams and especially the, the spoken exam, would you have all of your teachers use the Commonwealth chart? There's a nice scenario. What do you think? Raise of hand. Anyone want to take that one? Lisa, what do you think? Oh, we need your mute. Unmute. Uh, no, absolutely not. So when I first came across the, the North American color valve chart, I thought, um, great, I can use this. And then I thought when I came around to the to the uh, olive thing and the auburn and the orange, I thought, oh, oh, I'm going to have to change the way I speak. I thought, that's just rubbish. That's crazy. I can't do that. Forcing me to choose a different accent, it's just not it's not who I am. It's not bringing English to life. It's acting. So 
that's when when I finally found the Commonwealth chart, and that was my match. I was happy, as you know. So if my teachers asked me that question, I'd say pick a chart, you know, um, and just go with what feels natural for you. Don't change your accents around. It's just too much going on in here to try and do that. And I think that that conflict would just be exhausting. Um, and so some some of my students. Um, have had um, American English um, training before they get to, to get to New Zealand, and that's fine. They'll be they'll be using um, path and bath, no problem. But they won't be hearing me say that. I'll be saying path and bath, and that's okay. So just stick with the chart that you like. Don't change your accents. Uh, I, I just think that would just be awful. Any any different opinion? Because we have a really wonderful follow up question to this. If we want to continue with this this thread. Gemma, different opinion or are you in agreement? I don't have a different opinion per se, but based on that, I mean, exactly as Lisa, we don't have to change our accents, but also the, these exams, thankfully, they don't assess students based on their accent. Um, they, they assess students based on their intelligibility, even the Cambridge exams. So I would say exactly the same as Lisa, teachers should, should should choose the chart or choose the accent they want to teach and they, they feel comfortable with. And if teachers are worried about preparing their students for a certain accent, that can be done, you know, using audio exposure, you know, the listenings that you choose to prepare students for, you know, you can use that direction to prepare them for that exam, but they don't have to produce an accent for something like this. And, and I would add that even if, say, the representative of Cambridge exams were to say, uh, oh, yes, we're we're looking for the British accent. In fact, the, the people listening are simply it's not how we listen. We listen to understand. And when we understand somebody's English, that's the win. Um, I, I don't think we're in a place where it's going to. Um, I think it's been a long time since we've had actual dialect exams. And I'll, I'll speak to that very briefly uh, with a story from a colleague. If anybody is familiar, uh, Renee Feather was a colleague of mine at American University, and she was born and raised in New Jersey. And I, I cannot uh, imitate her accent, but it, let's just call it the, 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 a very strong, a beautiful example of the strong New Jersey accent uh, with words like coffee, um, very, very pronounced. And she is a bit older than me um, to the point where when she was graduating from her teacher's college in New Jersey, um, she was she did a big sigh of relief because she was the first graduating class that didn't have to pass a speech exam to be allowed to be a teacher, not an English, we're not talking about a ESL teacher, just a teacher to be allowed to be a teacher in New Jersey, they had to pass a dialect exam, essentially, a, a spoken English accent exam to prove that they knew how to speak without saying coffee. They had to say coffee. And she knew that she was going to fail that exam and she was worried about this, but there was a lot of dialogue around that and they they banished or, or changed the exam maybe, I've heard. And, and so she was able to become a teacher um, where she really was you know, in fear that she was going to be prevented from that despite all of her study. Um, I think that's a thing of the past. That was about 1969, I believe. Um, so, you know, that's that's a long time in the past. Um, who's doing the judging? And what are they really capable of judging anyway? Um, yeah. Karen, um, yes. Bridget had her hand up. She has a question. Hi, Bridget. Uh, thank you. I'd actually put it down, but I'm happy to contribute. Yes, my, my conundrum is that unlike Claire, I can't and don't want to try and shift my vowels because I can't do it as successfully as you, but I've got a British accent and I teach in the States and I really, I love the color vowel, but like you, Lisa, I hit that bottom section and I've ended up sort of using it for the more stable ones, as you said, like blue moon and green tea. And I haven't quite built up the confidence because for me, based on this, I would use the Commonwealth one, but that isn't really going to help my students, even though it'd be more convincing for me. So I would agree that that just puts too much strain as a teacher. And so it is a bit of a challenge if you're in a different um, context 
I mean, that, like I'm similar to Claire, but not as successful in shifting. So I wanted to sort of reinforce that feeling that you need to feel comfortable as a teacher and confident when you're showing the chart. So any advice would be welcome. I see Aviva raising her hand, uh, another fellow, um, Aviva's, Aviva, tell us about you and, and let us know what you think of Bridget's uh, important point there. Well, I, I completely understand Bridget because um, I have a Glasgow accent, or a very muted Glasgow accent now after so many years away from Glasgow, but I teach um, in, in Florida. So my accent is completely different to my fellow American teachers. And uh, I've actually found that in the classroom, to me, it doesn't matter at all because, you know, as I go, as, as I use the North American chart, I will say, you know, in my <laughs> Scottish English, then I would probably pronounce it using this color. In Florida, you're going to hear a lot of people pronouncing it, and I might do a full American accent and say, but it doesn't matter as long as the word is comprehensible, as long as you are intelligible, then it's not that my accent is right and that their accent is wrong. It's all about being understood. And I found that I'm not so worried about making a fool of myself trying to emulate the, the, Ameri the North American sound on the chart, that the more I do it and the easier it becomes. Um, and it hasn't it hasn't proved a huge problem, I have to say. Thank you. And I think listening to everybody, uh, particularly Gemma, saying how you're actually treating that to, to mine it, to help them as they navigate life in Glasgow City Centre or wherever you are, is really helpful. So I think, thank you. I'll be more confident in saying this is me. This is what you might hear. This is you. Are we staying in the right area? Yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to follow up on that question with another asked by Liz, um, and it's it's taking it to the other side, which is what happens to students' comfort level and pronunciation when their teacher on one day speaks with one accent and their teacher on another day, uh, meaning a different teacher, has a different accent. And I know Liz comes from a context where actually two, there, there are many different teachers for a given student in one week. Uh, because that particular volunteer model has different volunteers plugged in. So do we need to worry about our students? Uh, are we are we shifting the ground under their feet or are we uh, not? Are we doing something else above, like giving them a different image above their heads? I don't know what the analogy is. Um, should we worry? And, and if so, what is an administrator to do, by the way? Are we supposed to cultivate a faculty that has a more a cohesive range of accents for the sake of our learners? Is this a worry? Gemma, I see a reaction, so I'm going to start with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure for most of us, it's pretty impossible to, uh, to have a faculty, and also probably illegal <laughs> to, to have a faculty of just one nationality or one accent. Um, but I, I think um, I think it's it's actually a wonderful opportunity to reinforce to students. You're going to hear different variations of these sounds, and that's okay. Every teacher you hear using this sound, you are going to understand. They will be intelligible to you. Um, so just being honest and 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 saying this is a, an opportunity. And and I think a lot of people say, oh, but the students, their pronunciation might get confused these things don't happen the students don't Im imitate us a hundred percent and then leave the classroom with our accents that's just not happening um so I think it's actually a really positive thing if they've got that scenario with lots of different teachers interpreting the chart in accordance with their own accent I'd like to raise this question and encourage oh Liz did you want to follow up on that I'll invite you to unmute. As you're unmuting, let me just say one thing, and I'm going to ask you to elaborate. Um, but next, I would like to hear, because we haven't yet heard from um, many members of our audience who are non-native English speakers, specifically on this topic, what do you think? Would you Do you want to have teachers from a variety of accents, or does that feel confusing? I think that's a wonderful question for our non-native English speakers in the room. Um, so, Liz, would you like to further that question? Well, yes, I just wanted to also add that 
we have a pro I <laughs> have a problem with blue canoe because I don't have orange door that doesn't work for me and I do use uh, Auburn dog and so my students say well what happens I get these things wrong with uh, on blue canoe so what I've told them is you have a choice and I, I only like one of the choices um, you have a choice of just imitating Karen and getting a good score <laughs> or ignoring her because you're going to have in class you're going to say it one way and blue canoe will be something else and it'll be totally confusing so that's what I told them to do just say things the way I've told them and so if the score is not so high that's okay yeah so what that's is good. your response Thank you. Let me, um, let's see, how do I want to do this? I want to hear, uh, continuing on the question of, of accent variety in one's own learning, but I do want to address this question because it's a, it's a good one. Blue Canoe, uh, just so everybody knows, is our learner's uh, pronunciation app. Um, it is built around my dialect. So let's be, I'll be you know, open about that. We had to choose a model because we're training a computer to listen. And so what's it listening for? This is a big question. It's not actually listening to my model to uh, judge the student. It's listening to a collection of about 50 different English speakers from all over North America that we pooled, collected, recorded, and tagged. So there is some flexibility in there for whether you say cot or quat, uh, or if you say aunt or aunt. Um, but what it is teaching for sure is the location of stress. And that's where it, it cares more in those scores, by the way. Um, so that's, I wanted to just put that out there that it is not actually listening with, with my accent, although I am the voice model for, for the sentences. Um, having students practice with my voice model um, is not a bad idea because I'm modeling the stress of English. Um, my actual vowel sounds are not as much um, the the key importance there so much as the rhythm and um, and the time on the vowel so that's but it's not perfect it's a machine and uh, that's why I'll I'll go ahead and let that be the end of that that little answer on blue canoe I think it it's definitely a topic worth talking about more is what can machine learning do for uh, speech and pronunciation um, but no matter what it is built on some kind of an accent model or range of models put together and it's not easy. Um, but meanwhile, I have these beautiful humans in the room and we're the teachers and we interact with our students. So let's come back to that question. Non-native English speakers in the room. Can I hear from some of you with, with just a few thoughts? Cause we're, we're down to just a couple of minutes. Lots of ideas have come up today. If you need to leave, it's the top of the hour, it's time to go. But I would like to hear a couple of final thoughts before we one more time thank our panelists for all their fabulous insights and really just uh, stimulating our thoughts today about accented teaching. So non-native English speakers, any thoughts in the room? Jilson, how do you feel listening to all these different varieties of English? Is it illuminating or confusing or what? What's going on in your mind? Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, good morning, good afternoon. Good, good. <laughs> oh, Gary. Uh, this opened my mind, and now I can look for the color of our chart with the different way. I know that I, we can explore this chart in different ways, and uh, we can explore this chart thinking about accent. It's so important for me. I learned a, a lot today. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Jillison. I, I saw you there, so I called on you first, uh, but I, I won't necessarily see everybody. So please raise a hand if you would like to say something. I see Herrick in the room. Hi, Herrick. It's been a little while since we've seen each other. How, what's your perspective about different teachers having different accents for learners? Is that uh, a plus? Is that a risk? I think you're in Mexico. So do you have any thoughts on that scenario? Yeah, well, it is indeed a plus. I mean, the more languages, I mean, the more accents they are uh, um, used to listening to, the better, okay? Um, I mean, here in Mexico, we do have a lot of influence from North American English. 
the kind of English that is spoken in the States and in Canada. And so the kind of like the questions you were saying about like uh, having, you know, spoken uh, examinations from the UK, well, we get used to them anyway, okay? So it's like the cool thing about here, being here in Mexico, because we do have a lot of uh, influence from different accents, okay? So that's what I can say. We do understand, I mean, Amer North American English, but we uh, at the same time understand British English as well. So that is like cool, you know? <laughs> I don't know, it's, uh, it's been great, you know, listening to all of you uh, guys, okay? And uh, well, I do feel really grateful for having been invited to this event. Thank you very much, Karen, all right? And uh, yeah, I congratulate everyone. I don't know what else to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Wonderful to hear from you. And again, I, I think what's you. important is, notice what he said, it's the same thing we said from the beginning. We all understand each other in this room. Native, non-native accents, uh, British, Scottish, New Zealand, uh, Georgia, we understand each other. So why are we concerned? I mean, I'm not dismissing it, but it's so interesting that we're often concerned with the differences. When what we don't notice and what's right in front of us is the commonality. That's just a thought to stick with. Uh, we had a question in the room. Uh, Mariana has her hand up. Uh, Mariana, hello. Yes, hi. So first of all, I want to say I'm very happy to have this. <laughs> I just had my work study color code this so the packages won't get mixed up. Oh, there we go. I had to put colors. Um, so as a teacher, as a non-native teacher, I'm always a, aware of my accent. Um, as an administrator, I'm very happy to have a variety of, of um, accents uh, on the teaching team. And um, I think students are happy to have this exposure. And I, I believe that it prepares them for the world. Uh, on the same time, I do agree with a comment that was uh, made earlier that the color chart can help create a common ground. And I love that. Can't wait to try it. So, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And tell us just where you are. I'm curious. Are you here in the States? Yeah, I'm in Erie, Pennsylvania. Oh, wonderful. Right up the road from me. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mariana. I also had, I think, Gabby, you had a hand up. Uh, Gabby Propersi. Are you still yes. in the room? Hello, everyone. Thank you for this. I really enjoyed it. Uh, well, I when I came to, to, I have an Argentinian accent, which is a Spanish, which sounds differently compared to other Spanishes. And I, I was trained in British English all my life. Then I came here and to live in Texas, and the accent is very different. So being an SL, ESL teacher, I felt not confident at the beginning. So the messages you're sending are very good for me. And uh, I think that having my accent shows a lot about my culture and my identity. So I should value that. And this is what I, I'm trying to do, to learn to do. And well, I, I am on, on the good way for that. So yeah, I'm always trying to, to get better, but uh, that's the way it is. So it is a reality. I don't fight with my accent anymore. <laughs> right. That's right. No, and, and that's, that is the intention that we have in ColorVal is to resolve questions um, and maybe anything that's unclear and at the same time simply be a resource. So it's not a prescription, it's a resource, right? Um, I'll share one more example. Um, and here it's getting into one of, one of my heart-based topics, which is accent equity. Or uh, yeah, accent equity is probably the best way to say it. And that is, if we can use the chart to understand how it is that we're different, we can also understand what's the same. Um, but I'm finding it's very helpful where, where in the past, we didn't have a way to talk about how things sound. We would be left to imitation. And imitation can easily end up as mockery. And so then in fear of mockery, we shut it down. So we don't have an easy way to have this dialogue. And I, I invite you to just be aware that the chart can be useful among, let's just call ourselves speakers of English, non-native, not non-native, just speakers of English. And that will allow us to say, wait, do you use gray for that? I use red for that. And that can be a wonderful way, speaking of administrators, to bring your team closer together. 
Um, and the example I'll give, and it was a rather uncomfortable one, is with, and Shirley, my co-author is in the room. Hello, Shirley. I just want to wave. Shirley and I were in Delaware several years ago now, and we had a large group we were training of teachers. And, uh, you'd, you know, I thought Delaware, that everyone would be from Delaware. But guess what? <laughs> They're from all over the country and all over the world. And so they were in a large circle. They were discussing poetry, marking up poetry with color vowels and talking about how to teach English language arts with uh, color vowels and enhancement. Really neat. Um, and the conversation was going on with about a big circle of about 15 people and another one in another room. So I was listening sort of globally when I heard this sort of a, a little explosion of laughter, but also kind of a high voice. And I thought, oh, what's what's happening over there? Um, and when I turned and looked, this one teacher said, say it again to this this teacher in the room. So that teacher was suddenly spotlighted and she looked kind of shy and she looked up and smiled and, and they said, say it again. And so I came over, I was like, what, what is it? And she said, poem. And the teacher who had pointed, pointed at her said, say it again, poem. And, and, and she said, she says poem that way. So there's a sudden like outing among these teachers that this, this person speaks in a funny way and, you know, say it again, say it again. So I kind of, I just stepped, I was like, oh, well, let's look at the chart. Let's see what's happening here. <laughs> so we just went to the chart and, and then I'll ask you the same way I asked them. Um, the way the, the pointing teacher says poem is poem. What color is she using? Poem, poem, poem. Yeah, you might be hearing rose, boat, poem, poem, okay. The teacher who was suddenly in the spotlight was saying, poem, poem. How's that different? Poem, poem. You might hear poem is two, poem, 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 one syllable, but there's also a color difference. Long story short, we were able to say, oh, so you say poem with Rose Boat, as do many of us, and our colleague here says it with turquoise, poem, as one syllable. And by the time I finished with that very short analysis, uh, all of the energy had become much more less, well, much less charged, more neutral around this person. And she, I, I could see her relax because we suddenly had an easy way to talk about these differences. And so her accent was no longer a point of ridicule or uh, to put her up on a strange pedestal that she didn't want to be on, uh, but rather, oh, they're, guess what? They're really next to each other. They're quite close to one another. That works really well. So watch for these teachers because this isn't just about you teaching pronunciation, but also about how we model accent uh, equity, accent, openness, and accessibility uh, to all of our learners about the ways that we speak. Yeah. I want to thank you. You know, I'm going to kind of close this down. I don't want to. I want to keep you with me all day. But I want to thank you for being here. I think this has been a very important topic. Um, this has been rounded out by all of you being here. That tells me it's important to you. Our panelists have put a great deal of, of thought and effort into today's presentations. Please take a moment to thank them. Um, I want to thank our behind the scenes people, Jennifer and Lynn and, uh, and Aviva, who have been over there in the chat with you, as well as all of our Color Val teachers pitching in and sharing opinions and thoughts. Um, and all of you who are new, please consider joining our little movement because I think what we're doing is powerful and I'd love to see you as part of what we do. Um, you've seen a lot of links. If you've missed anything in the chat, no worries. We're sending out a follow-up email. It will have a recorded session link to this session. It will have several links for how to get started with us if you're new or how to continue with us if you haven't been back for a little while. Um, please take a moment in the chat if you want to say anything. Watch for that link to the survey. We'll send it there in the email as well. We'd love your feedback. Um, tell others about what we're doing, and we hope to see you again soon. And by the way, we do have a April webinar series coming up. There will be three different webinars, and I do hope to see you there. So be safe. Have a great day. 
And as I finish up, because I don't like always hearing my voice, I'd like uh, maybe three quick takeaways for three different people. One idea that will stick with you. Teachers, you know how I roll with this. So three takeaways. That's a sentence. Can I dive over to, I'm looking around the room here. Laura, I've been watching your face. Any thoughts today? How's it been for you? Laura Holland. Yes, Laura Holland. Uh, oh, it's been great. It's been, a, I was just typing. It's been a minute since I've done any training with you and it's it's really helpful and, and bringing it back to me. And I just, for me, the issue of variety, um, opening our students ears up to the variety of Englishes that they're going to encounter is the useful tool. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that can be an opportunistic, just every time we have someone, it's it's right there on the chart. Thank you. All right. Any other takeaways? Hi, Dorley. I love the discussion about equity because for too long, there was too much focus on the right accent, the wrong accent. I remember way back in Brazil learning English. My teachers had more of a American uh, accent because that's where they were trained. Then we would have British consultants over in our institute and they would say, ah, oh, you have American English accent. And so there was too much of that going on for way too long. And so this conversation is very, very important. Equity, comprehensibility, intelligibility, mutual, mutual intelligibility. And as educators, I think we have an important role in that, to have that openness and this acceptance. Thank you so much for this session. Thank you, Dorling. Elizabeth has her hand up. All right, Elizabeth. I was just going to say, I teach um, refugee children in the summer at a camp. And when I first did it, I had, um, I, I have a lot of family with the Southern draw accent. So I don't really even notice accents and I needed a spelling assessment done. I handed it to one of the volunteers and the first word she read, I was like, oh my gosh, the different accent. I'm not going to get a clear spelling assessment out of this. And so I found out for this year, we have a strong Alabama draw accent come in the first week when I would do all my assessments. And I've been like, awesome. I have all these teachers coming, but the accent is going to be so different. So this is just really encouraging to remind me that as I'm introducing the chart for the first time, the fact that I'm going to have these drastically different accents is a plus because I can pull that and show this difference without necessarily having to highlight see your Burmese accent is different than your Congolese accent that's you know and they can see that while I'm showing it in American English if that makes sense and so it was just an encouraging way and yes I have learned not to give spelling assessments <laughs> with drastically different accents than they're used to <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, really taking a different lens on, you know, the diversity. Oh my gosh, is this a problem because it's all different or is this a big opportunity? And I just think that's a beautiful way to, to round out our conversation today. So thank you. Once again, I want to thank uh, Lisa Lamar, Gemma Archer, and Claire Schneider for their time and their expertise and insight today. Uh, please join us again, everybody, and we'll see you again soon. Blue moon soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.